This conference will now be recorded. So good morning once again. Uh, actually, there is a small notice before the uh, instructions given to me. Some of you are leaving in the uh, after the starting of the class. We were instructed to note down who are all left. So from now onwards, we are going to make a list of recording of the people who have left because we get message here now. As per my side, it's up to you. I already attend or actually listen to it all on. It's left to you anyway. Uh, the topic given to me is uh, neonatal jaundice. Actually, Dr. Ravideep is supposed to do, do this job. Unfortunately, he has left the institute and so it was given to me. The neonatal jaundice is a very, very important topic from your examination point of view, both from the clinical and also from the theory point of view. Maybe you may not ask the exactly right on essay on neonatal jaundice, but you may ask for management or various diagnostic modalities. Therapeutic modalities say it in whichever way it is asked, you must be able to answer. So, this is one of the major problems we are facing with neonatology jaundice. So, let us go. What is a neonatal jaundice? Let us see. So, this is a concept map we are going to discuss today. What is the definition of a jaundice? The basic concept of bilirubin metabolism, how neonatal jaundice appears, pathophysiology behind it, various types of neonatal jaundice, what happens because of jaundice complications. Now, do you manage them? These are the basic concepts. So, any one of them, or some of them, maybe it's the examination, you must be able to answer. All of you know the yellowish discoloration, the skin and sclera. Because the deposition of bilirubin dye is called as a joint. So, when is it actually visible? To make it visible in an adult sclera, the concentration of bilirubin has to be at least 2 milligram per deciliter. And to make it visible in a newborn skin, it must be at least 5 milligrams before it, mm, we can visualize and notice it in a newborn skin. That is the approximate level section. So, how prevalent is this? Only 60% of the already full term babies, and if it's a preterm, nearly 80% of the new ones they do develop some amount of neonatal jaundice, whether it is mild, moderate, whatever else. So, it is such a prevalent condition, so they must, you know, must learn something about it. So, then the basic metabolism of the bilirubin, I just to diagram a representation. All of you know where from the bilirubin has come from the heat. In the RBC is destroyed inside the spleen. Maybe 80% of this from the spleen is its source. Some of the bilirubin, actually, some may come directly from the bone marrow and other areas, 20 20%. So, whatever it is, the heme released from the hemoglobin is connected to the reticular endothelium. These are the RES, reticular endothelial cells, most often in the spleen or in the periphery also. So, these reticular endothelial cells, once the heme reaches here, by the action of a heme oxygenase enzyme, the heme is converted into biliverdin. And this biliverdin is an intermediate product. Again, in the presence of a biliverdin reductase, the biliverdin is converted to bilirubin dye. And this bilirubin dye is released into the blood and along with albumin, because it's, it cannot sustain the free, free form is very, very little, it gets attached to the albumin in the plasma. So from this, from here it goes into the liver. Once into the liver, actually there is four points that are necessary. Uptake of the conjugated, there is uh, bilirubin that is attached to albumin is one. Then the process of conjugation <clears throat> with the glucuronic acid. Then it has to be secreted with the bile. Uh, then drain into the intestines. So the uptake, conjugation, secretion, and drainage happens inside the liver. So what happens? The bilirubin which has come into the liver get conjugated with the glucuronic acid in the presence of a uridine diphosphate glucuronic acid. And this conjugated bilirubin is secreted into the <coughs> biliary system. And from here through the bile duct, it goes into the intestine. 
in intestine because of the bacterial action it's converted to the eobilinogen which is a colorless pigment eobilinogen then into stercobilinogen stercobilin and ultimately it's created in this too some amount of eobilinogen which is a colorless product has been absorbed back into the blood actually through the enterohepatic circulation from the intestines back into the blood and again to the liver this is the enterohepatic circulation to small nearly 20% of the bilirubin that has passed into the intestine. And out of this, a fraction of it, urobilinogen, goes into the kidney and gets excreted in the form of a urobilin is again colorless product. So apart from this small amount, usually happens very, very negligible amount, most of it comes cyclic back into the liver and again conjugate uptake, conjugation secretion and goes up. So this, as all of you know. Examination, if you are asked for examination, it is always diagrammatic representation is very, very important. Whether you write it all this or not. So, and drawing all these diagrams may be very, very difficult. So, for your sake, I have given a simple line diagram which you can do the same thing actually. You represent a reticular endothelial system as a square. Heme has come inside. Where from it has come? From the RBC. Where from RBC came? Hemoglobin is broken into heme and globulin. Globin goes into the protein catabolism and the protein catabolism. So the heme part only comes back and in presence of heme oxygenation and oxygenase converted to bilirubin, bilirubin reductase, bilirubin, bilirubin with albumin goes into the liver and unconjugated bilirubin gets conjugated with the UDPGA. Conjugated bilirubin through the bile duct and into the intestine under the microbial action converted to urobilinogen and stercobilin and excretion. Part of it comes back into the liver. This is the enterohepatic circulation via portal system. So, non heme source, as I said, I was from the, from the kidney and other areas, actually bone marrow, one milligram per kg, very little. As for the hemoglobin is concerned, each gram of hemoglobin releases about 34 milligrams of bilirubin. bilirubin. And as I said, a fraction of it goes into the kidney and gets it to the lobe. This diagram you can all of you can write easily. Remember this one square, one rectangle, one triangle, and one circle, semicircle. These with these diagrams you can represent it. Only thing is order, you just remember these things. These enzymes are also important because any deficiency of any way in these enzymes can result in the what is called as a Various forms of jaundice may occur here. So, so I just gave another example that is from the textbook also again. But you draw only one example. This same thing in a very diagrammatic representation. How it is all has come. So, all of you, those of you who have downloaded the PDF, you can go through that leisurely. And various, whichever diagram you feel, just try it. Nothing, nothing special. So. Various types of jaundice. There are physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice. This is the most important when you are talking about neonatal jaundice. This is very, very important. What is physiological? What is pathological? Physiological appears within 20, after 24 hours, total bilirubin, less than 5 milligrams per deciliter per day. So the daily increments actually. The maximum it may go up to 4th or 5th day in a term. Or in preterm, we go up to seventh day also. Go up to serum levels never cross 15 milligrams total, and clinically not detectable after two weeks. Next, this is a usual phenomenon for physiological joints. Whereas any one of these points, it is very easy to remember, which appears before 24 hours, which rises more than five milligram per day. So that is the second. Bilirubin may cross 15 milligrams anytime. Joint is persisting beyond 14 days. Direct bilirubin, because all the time we have been talking about the indirect bilirubin. So if a direct bilirubin even crosses 2 milligrams per day, so it is important. Or the child is looking sick. Say child in any reason. If even the amount is less than 10, but child is looking sick, you must suspect it is a possible type of pathological joint because sepsis also can cause. So these are the general principles. If you remember this, you can just easily reproduce it. Just remember one, the other one automatically comes out. What is physiological? What is pathological? Especially in the clinics, many of them, because short case is a we knew one always. So many of you may get this question. How do you what are the criteria to call it a pathological? So physiological joint is once again. 
the increased value. What is the cause of the why, why I'm telling physiological jaundice is there? Why should there be physiological jaundice? So it is either production of the bilirubin is increased. Why in a newborn? The RPC volume per kg man, is increased per load because mother baby, even if a little a few seconds delay in transit, uh, separation of the umbilical cord and severance, it will add extra load. Not only that, the RPC survival usually in adult is 120 days, all of you know. In newborn, the survival rate is very, very 90 hours. So it gets destroyed much more easily. So increased inefficiency of erythropoiesis, ineffective erythropoiesis. What happens? What is this not formed into the RPC? It gets into the heme. There's the, the heme, which cannot be con converted to hemoglobin, goes into this bilirubin metabolism. And increase the turnover of non-hemoglobin heme protein. Even it is a very fraction, but then its turnover is supposed to be increased in new one. So these are the causes for the increased bilirubin production. And it may be because defective uptake, as I said, once into the liver, it has to be because ligand, there is what is happening always the connective protein, receptor protein is that if the receptor is not well mature at the liver cell level, so there is a more hemoglobin demand. Decrease in binding of ligand by other anions, even that even the ligand is there, so connection protein uptake. So the liver uptake of bilirubin is diminished. The third mechanism is decreasing clearance because it is a UDP granule transfer is necessary for conversion of a decreased activity. If this activity gene UGT 1A1, it is called the gene. So if this gene is deficient, UDPG efficiency is diminished. So conjugation process delay. So more of a bilirubin is remained in the circulation. Lastly, decreased excretion. So for some reason, decreased intestinal bacteria, because what, what happened? The bacteria is responsible for the unconjugation and actually the enterohepatic circulation. The circulation is not efficient, only the remains in the blood. Decreased gut motility, the poor evacuation of the bilirubin lad mechanism. Suppose the meconium is blocking it. What happens? The bilirubin, which is excreted into the intestine, remains in the intestine for longer time. So the more chances of enterohepatic circulation. So these are all the possible mechanisms why the normal physiological so whatever it is, serum bilirubin level should not be rises more than two milligrams per day first week of after birth. So this is the normal course. You can see in a full term baby after one day, that is after beyond 24 hours, it start increasing. So if it is term baby, it raises maximum 10 or 12 and return by 10th day as usual. Whereas Yes. In preterm, we can start even early a little within a minute of 24 hours. Peak may lower up to 12 or 13 also, and it may take longer 12 or 13 days actually. So the two curves indicate normal physiological jaundice in a preterm baby and preterm baby. This line also will be easy to draw an examination. Just remember the days. It should start beyond one first year, first day. And end either 10th or 12th day. So two lines, one different colors you can use in period in, in examination. We can show one is for the preterm, one is for the term baby. That's all. Now some of the abnormal jaundices, but not really pathological. They are actually breastfeeding jaundice and breast milk jaundice. Many often the examiners sort of fond of it. So what is breastfeeding jaundice? You know, feeding is a result of the baby not receiving enough milk to the it may lower the bilirubin because if there is enough milk it is been intestines it is carried away in the absence of a food what the only food is nothing baby's food is only milk so what happens empty stomach so the bilirubin enterohepatic circulation increases if there is some milk actually it washes out and goes into the stool so in the absence of enough milk what happens enterohepatic circulation increases this causes bilirubin to be reabsorbed into the intestines and keep the levels elevated which triggers jaundice so if it is crosses above two milligrams it is jaundice actually five milligrams it is visible this usually occurs in the first week of life when the baby and mother both are early stages of learning how to breastfeed because this happens especially in the primary mothers where they don't take enough food and actually you know, they don't know how to feed all these things so this is commonly happening what is called the first feeding. the treatment is actually increased number of feedings actually if you keep on frequent feeding and good hydration of the mother that's most important. Whereas there is another milk which is related to the breast milk. It is called the breast milk jaundice. What happens is it develops after the first week and are nearly two to three weeks, up to two to three weeks. 
calcium and it will go up to 10 mg per deciliter. This is linked to some, some substance, unknown substance, which is present in the breast milk. They used to say pignanidia diol. Pignanidia or for 20 beta diol, something they used to say, but it's not definite. That's why I'm not mentioning the substance name. It is unknown substance, which inhibits liver's ability to break down and process bilirubin and leading to increased concentration of beta glucuronidase in the instrument. So increased deconjugation occurs and then reabsorption of the bilirubin. So mother should be, even here the treatment is, they should continue breast milk. It's not necessary they have to stop. Though it is the breast milk case, the is only TSB, serum bilirubin is usually decline over a period of time. The only thing is you have to rule out all other possible causes of a pathological problem. If you're not sure, if you are sure it's nothing serious, you can just, uh, the only thing is you have to eliminate by clinical examination, proper history taking, proper examination. That's all. So these are the difference breast milk jaundice, breastfeeding jaundice, and breast milk jaundice. Breastfeeding jaundice occurs early, breast milk jaundice later, and it is a prolonged jaundice. There is a difference. Now, coming to the pathological jaundice, as I said, once again, I reiterate the points. If it beyond 24, within 24 hours, and it lasts more than one week or 10 days, more than two weeks, and after first week, so it starts nearly after first week. In the first week, entirely everything normal. Then it starts developing. That is also abnormal. That's a late development of jaundice. And bilirubin rising very fast, five milligrams per day, per deciliter per day. Uh, very, very unusual. And total bilirubin crossing even 15, so again 18 also. Infant shows symptoms and signs of serious illness. If the child is sick, we have to think of pathological. Rise in BDN per hour also, 0.2 milligrams per deciliter per hour also is very abnormal. Conjugated bilirubin, even if it is more than one milligram also is abnormal because whatever the physiological or pathological jaundice so far we have been taught is unconjugated. So if, <coughs> excuse me, if conjugated bilirubin even more than one milligram is uh, it is abnormal. And if the total TSB rises 20% of, if it constitutes more than 20% of the total serum bilirubin, that is also abnormal. So it is suggestive of okay, some way cholestasis is happening, obstructive jaundice is developing. These are the things missing of pathological jaundice. So why are we bothered about jaundice at all? Now there is a problem. When what happens? So the pathological jaundice, if the plasma concentration, the unconjugated bilirubin exceeds more than 20 to 25 milligrams, until then the albumin binds it actually. The albumin binding capacity has been only 20 to 25. Beyond 20 to 25, what happens is, uh, one second. So, beyond 20 to 25, this is the limit actually. So, it crosses the blood brain barrier. So, if left untreated, this is resulting hyperbilirubinia, what is called as a toxic bilirubin toxic encephalopathy, especially it is attracted to the Vessel ganglia, cardiac nucleus, putamen, and all these things. So it may lead to mental retardation, chronic and cerebral cerebral palsy. So these are the dangers. That's why we have to be cautious about the bilirubin. So what are the types of pathological? Is it actually pathological jaundice is all causes women? There are you can categorize them. One is a hemolytic, one is a non-hemolytic type. It's so examples of hemolytic <clears throat> are incompatible to blood incompatible. So I, RH isoimmunization is the commonest one. AB will also cause actually, though not that dangerous. The congenital spherocytosis, these abnormal shapes and abnormal hemoglobin thalassemias. Sepsis is actually, it may cause mixed type actually. Disseminated intravascular coagulations. Peristorage hematomas, either it's a bad hematoma or whatever it is actually. There is this hidden hemorrhages the body gradually it has been resolved now. at times it may use unconjugated so any cause of polycythemia because more rbc more rbc getting destroyed and they will cause a unconjugated bilirubin. so these are all related to hemolysis the other variety is non hemolytic because it is as i said breast milk jaundice is a type of non milk there is some substance which is preventing the conjugation process the same thing krigler nagel syndrome type 1 and type 2 actually depending upon the severity this is the absence of uridibase glucuronyl transferase enzymes. Genetically, there is a genetic abnormality which is within the liver. So in the absence of enzymes, there is no conjugation activity. The bilirubin is spills back into the blood from the liver and then serum bilirubin, unconjugated hybrid bilirubin occurs. 
Gilbert syndrome is also a genetic disease. Periodic thinning actually keeps coming and going. This is because of the ligand deficiency. Where is uptake is deficient in the bilirubin. So now a word about the hemolytic disease of H D N. Very very important. Hemolytic disease of newborn because of the isoimmunization. R H isoimmunization is the most common, is most severe because the antibodies are very very small and they cross in bond. So IBO and compatibility less severe because the antibody size is larger. The chances of transmission to the mother to child are very so what happened the first pregnancy nothing happened because mother is so let us the father is a positive mother here the father positive father so you can see father is rh positive mother is rh negative so first pregnancy sensitized if some amount what happens at the time of delivery uh, what happened the time of delivery rh baby what happens there is the fetus gets the rh positive fetus blood cells enters the mother and creates a reaction at this time. So until delivery, there is no spillage from the mother to baby to father. That's why no problem. So what happens? These antibodies which developed in the mother, these antibodies remain in the next pregnancy. What happens? These antibodies cross to the baby and may cause hemolysis in the baby. Because these are RH positive, these are antibodies taken to positive, hemolysis occurs and jaundice develops. If it is so severe, it may cause a Hydroxyphetal. Severe anemia, baby may die also because of the hydroxyphetalis. <clears throat> so, this uh, baby fetal RBC lies. So, what happens to the anti <clears throat> hemolytic disease of the mother, RHD negative mother, RBC positives develop and antibodies develop. These antibodies, subsequent pregnancy, they destroy the RBC of the fetus. Hemolysis will the fetal RBCs. If it is severe, this is the form actually fetal death or anthroblastosis, which always is a serious, extreme serious condition. This happens fetal death or uh, severe hydroxyphetalis because there is a severe anasarca in the newborn baby. So, when clinically, when we want to see what is the problem, how do you differentiate diagnose the baby? So, if the baby is developed in the first 24 hours, possibility is hemorrhagic disease of the newborn or intrauterine infections also can cause. So, all the intrauterine infections are rich in barbity, AB1 compatible to the first hour. Are infections like torch infections, congenital malaria, GSSPD deficiency, these are the causes very early manifestations. Suppose first day is not there, it's coming on the second day. Commonest causes, as I said, physiological. So, other than physiological, sometimes sepsis also can be a second day. Because of the polycythemia also, they may manifest later on. Cephal hematoma, all these hidden hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhage, because of this resolution, slowly second or third or fourth day, it may develop actually. So, until third week, it keep on coming. Various hemolytic disorders, as I said, it is a spherocytosis, thalassemia, all these things. And enzyme deficiency, Kregler-Nazza syndrome, various type 1, type 2, Kregler-Nazza syndrome, Gilbert syndrome, well, these thing, all these things can manifest in the second or third week. And there are situations. Very late development after third week also. This happens in the breast milk jaundice. As I said, you need to keep on giving initially, okay, gradually, breast milk jaundice appears second or third week. Metabolic disorders like galactosemia, <clears throat> they, they, where there is a problem and it develops gradually, slowly. Neonatal hepatitis and extra, biliary, extra hepatic biliary atresia or intrahepatic biliary atresia. These things actually, the conjugate bilirubins, they tend to develop within a little slowly. Congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis also because of the increased enterohepatic circulation because the body blood not much food is going into the intestine so increased enterohepatic circulation so clinically you can present with dehydration child with profuse vomitings especially a chylogen because by less pain no? so profuse vomiting immediately after food and there is a visible peristalsis and actually all these things will take you congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So these are the differential diagnosis for this. Now clinical assessment of the, how do you know how severe is the jaundice? This is a Kramer index, all of you should be familiar with actually. So Kramer index is, this is a simplistic mechanism I tell you. First, how severe is, as the severity increases, the limb circuit. So if it is a very mild, see you take the lower one actually, we are talking about milligrams only because those people who are going for the, <clears throat> 
USMLA are there actually, they use micromoles actually, but their convenience are given. Don't get confused, surely we follow only serum milligrams. So if it is up to seen only up to face, let us see only up to face, it is roughly five milligrams. So if you see the chest and upper, upper limbs actually, body of the chest also, it is nearly, is up to 10 milligrams approximately. So it is going to the third zone, that is below the umbilicus level, it is nearly 12 milligrams approximately. And you can see the limbs also, limbs and legs, hands and legs, it is nearly 15 milligrams. So if it crosses even the soles, maybe up to beyond 15 milligrams. So the reason for this depth of the C joint is, why is this actually because of the affinity to albumin? As you know, the bilirubin, as, is, as soon as it releases from the liver into the blood, it gets attached to the albumin. So where is albumin produced? In the liver. So if it is only little, little is there, immediately albumin takes it away, it doesn't show. So if it crosses the real entire albumin is being saturated with bilirubin, so then it goes to the other areas. So if it is small saturation and circulation by the portal circulation comes here, immediately the close up areas only it is manifesting. So if it is the saturated albumin, it goes to the even to the peripheries of the blood circulation because free albumin, free bilirubin is available to get deposited in the subcutaneous tissues even here. So when the saturation is increasing, that's why as the increase concentration, the distal parts of the body also get that is the mechanism they say. So as far as you know, it is five zones is created up to the neck, chest, below the umbilicus, limbs, and in the palms and soles. So these are 5, 10, 12, 15. You remember these numbers. This is only this. Okay. <clears throat> Just make a note of all these things. Then we go to the next one. <clears throat> what are the other lab investigations? You can classify them into first line, second line, and third line. You can measure the serum bilirubin's total, how much it is actually, how much is conjugated, how much is non-conjugated actually to see. Blood group of the baby and mother also important. The peripheral smear to see evidence of any spherocytosis, hemolysis, actually seeing the target cells, all these things. So simple test. Second line is hematocrite because <clears throat> whenever there is hemolysis, HCT hematocrisis, the reticulocyte count also increases, retic count. Direct improvement. The disease is a human hemolysis because all these RH incompatibilities, AB1 incompatibilities, direct comes is positive because of the antibodies present. G6 PDSA as when necessary. Sepsis screen because if the child is looking sick, you have to see what is the band compound, micro ESR, all these things actually. ESERP, all these things. Where is liver and thyroid function because hypothyroidism also produces. Hyperbilirubinemia. So these are the things. Then very rarely we use, for example, torch screen, liver scans, and conjugate liver bilirubinemia. If you suspect, you have to see it has scans and actually transcutaneous bilirubin scanning. Ultrasonography of the liver and bile ducts, cholestasis if you are suspected in such conditions. So these are the first line investigations, second line investigations, and third line investigations. Apart from that, in day-to-day -day experience, we can see what is called the transcutaneous bilirubin. This is a simple mechanism you have seen. See, this is how it looks like that. You apply on the forehead or the chest sternum. So it measures, the meter gives you the recording. So they say there's a very good correlation with the venous blood serum bilirubin. So TCB assessment is very, very much especially for monitoring once you start on the therapies and all these things. So transcutaneous bilirubin measurement is also making very routine here now. now. Risk stratification, because this is important. So what action to take? Depending upon, so these nomograms are given, especially depending upon this, there is serum bilirubin level. So as it increases, so, and beyond the age also, because the same level at different ages, the decision is same. So the first 12 hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours, 72 hours, these are the nomograms because all this area, this area is a low risk area. 
So this is a low risk area. You can see. So if it is a low to intermediate, if it crosses at 70 hours, if it crosses 12 and between 12, 13, this becomes an intermediate area. So the same 70 hours, if it crosses 15 or 16, this is the dangerous area. So that's why that's how you stratify them to various types of severity. So your action depends upon the high risk, intermediate, high intermediate, low intermediate, and low risk. So depending upon what action to take. So within 24 hours, it said if it is a small trade, even 12, if it crosses even eight, this goes to high risk area. So you see the same area, same concentration after 48 hours is a not so dangerous. Like that, <clears throat> this nomogram is very, very important. There are other tests that actually may not be necessary for under ideas. End tidal carbon monoxide concentration is a newer technology. So the carbon monoxide is released only from the bilirubin metabolism, but only thing is you have to correlate with the atmospheric carbon monoxide. This is corrected ETC end tidal carbon monoxide concentration is with better methods. It is anything more than 2 ppm is taken as an abnormal. That means high bilirubin levels. And also wind score is called as a bilirubin induced neurological dysfunction. How dangerous actually has it caused any neurological damage or not? It's called as a wind score. Again, under edits, we may not ask just for your interesting, depending upon the subtle signs are there, where the signs of encephalopathy are there. Or bilirubin encephalopathy advanced are there, depending upon the scoring is given. So don't bother about that. Now, what is the management strategies? We have the four management strategies. First is phototherapy. The second is intravenous immunoglobulin sometimes. Exchange transfusion and medications. These are the four the modalities available. Of all of them, the first and foremost is the phototherapy. So how does phototherapy mechanism of action? What happens is that when light, especially the 450 nanometer, especially the blue light, has got a light efficiency to convert the bilirubin and conjugate bilirubin <clears throat> into soluble bilirubin forms, which can be excreted. It's not it is the only isomerization. <clears throat> Three mechanisms are given. One is a configuration isomerization. The most common thing they say is a second one is a structural isomerization. So the first one is configurational, the second one is a <coughs> structural isomerization, third one is a photo oxidation. Of this, quantity wise, the configuration isomerization is much more common, but it is a very, very reversible, highly reversible phenomenon. So immediately Z isomers are converted into E isomers, which are non-toxic and they can be excreted. Structural isomerization converts bilirubin to lumirubin. So this is a, a sort of a little less percentage, but it is a permanent one. So these two constitute the major mechanisms for the conversion. The third one is photo oxidation, very relative. So photo oxidant products are excreted in the urine. <clears throat> this is a very, very small fraction. But three mechanisms, you remember that. For this, what is actually light source is kept above the baby. You can see this baby. And light baby and naked baby is kept on the board. And what is important is the irradiance. It's not the... See uh, how many lights you have put actually all these things. This irradiance is very important. 10 microwatt per watt per square centimeter per nanometer of the irradiance with the wavelength. 3 microwatt per square centimeter per nanometer. And maximum you go for the 30 microwatts per, per square centimeter per nanometer. This is called the intensity. So, but this. And within the wavelength of 430 to 490, these are important. You cannot give any wavelength that can measure that, not here the red range or yellow range. So within this 430 to 450 nanometer wavelength, this should be 10 to 30 microwatts per square centimeter per nanometer. So we may not ask, but just remember that. This wavelength is very important between 460 to 490 is very important. The skin is exposed continuously, sometimes intermittently, and you keep measuring the photosynthesis. Monitoring is very, very important because there are adverse effects because of this. What happens is there is insensible water losses increase because fluid requirement may increase. You have to watch, we may have to give IV fluids also sometimes. Sometimes they may develop loose tools and that increases actually fluid problems, actually, shortage dehydration. Some children may develop mild rashes, 
and bronze baby is a very rare actually it's because of a prolonged phototherapy the body term becomes a child because bronze and because skin change color changes which is a dangerous thing actually we don't allow that to develop actually. hyperthermia especially in the when you use the fluorescent fluids there is a possibility and now the cfl tubes have come and actually leds also came where you can keep the distance also because usually 30 30 centimeters you can see that actually how much distance it is kept in 30 centimeter 40 centimeters distance from the body now there may be the blankets also kept you can even cover the touching also these led blankets it keep the baby covered also occasion hypocalcemia develops occasion so these are the complications of phototherapy just remember them so when to use exchange transfusion next one so this is called the double volume blood exchange because what you have to you cannot suddenly remove the blood and actually replace it what happens is you keep some amount of aliquots of blood 10 ml per kg or so and again remove the baby so mixing up occurs that's why double the blood volume the baby has got 80 ml per kg per body weight uh, blood volume you have to give 160 ml blood per kg blood volume this is called the double volume blood exchange so if the cord blood is more than 5 mg or cord hemoglobin because severe anemia you may not be able to notice during this such case actually this is also indication and if the hydroxy is developed sometimes if this baby is very anemic you might go to partial exchange what happens if you don't do These are the baby connectors. Babies develop connectors. These are pistil on this baby. You can see the arch like because of the convulsions and vessel ganglia is damaged. Right? There is an increase in tone of the muscles. So all the extra peripheral symptoms. So hyperbilirubinia and conjugate bilirubinia crosses into the blood brain across the blood brain barrier and gets deposited in the vessel ganglia. So this danger occurs in the plasma level exceeds 25 milligrams, especially in the RH gene matter. We do not know the exact cause. The RH gene matter body has got more chances of developing cancer than any other cause of hyperbilirubinemia. So we have to be very very careful. So instead of treating, the prevention is better actually. Whenever now the identification of the RH gene matter body has increased now, so especially the previous child is positive actually, you can prevent it by giving anti-D globulin to the mother. Within 24 hours, actually, what happens? This destroys the antibodies. So, if you give the mother within 24 hours of baby, whatever the sensitizing antibodies enter the baby mother, mother, they can be neutralized with the antidepressant. So, subsequent child, because it may not be having the even the first pregnancy itself, you notice that this will protect the next child from the developing a sensitization. And adequate breastfeeding because this prevents the breastfeeding joint disease, all these things problems, even dehydrations. And you keep following up regularly. You just don't send away the baby and put all the blood in his high or put him the fetal therapy or some therapy. You keep following the baby. That's why prevent complications. Explain the red flag signs. If you discharge the mother, and you have to tell them not to notice. Actually, when they 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 become lethargic, they become tremors, they actually become convulsion like thing. They be not feeding well or deepening of the joint disease, actually spreading to the Hands to the links and all these things. So these mothers will notice, especially these happen. These are normal babies, normal delivery babies where you are sending the baby home. So, so that's why you can prevent a little bit toxicity. A few words just before I close about the cholesterol. This is another form of a bilirubin toxicity. The unconjugated. All the other time we are talking about this is conjugated bilirubin. It doesn't cause bilirubin encephalopathy, but other problems develop. So conjugated bilirubinemia, even if it causes one milligram per deciliter, and 15% of the total bilirubin levels, the defects in intrahepatic bile production and defects in transmembrane transport of the bile, ah, uh, there is an obstruction to the bile duct narrowing. So this is clinically they are present with hepatomegaly or splenomegaly or some may be there, and. Pale stools. You can see the difference. This is a normal baby has got this type of stool. Abnormal baby this is a pale stool. There is an echolic stool. So this is the difference. And dark urine because you know unconjugated bilirubin, whatever it is, urine is always not yellow. Whereas conjugated bilirubin, urine become yellow. So that is the problem. So obstructive bile duct. What is the treatment? It depends upon the <clears throat> which causes it. Biliary atresia, pleural cyst. Sepsis, with mixed genetics, a urinary tract infection produces mixed infections. Alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, various metabolic problems like erectus anemia, tyrosinemia, and storage diseases. 
immunological disorders like autoimmune liver diseases, neonatal hepatitis, SLE, and endocrine hypothyroidism, pan hypopituitarism, and sometimes therapeutic have TPN may produce this type of abnormalities. So history is very, very important identifying this. We can do transhumanizers as uh, AST and ALT levels increase, alpha and phosphatidine levels increase, gamma glutamate transferase because all these indication of the obstructive joints. Abdominal ultrasonography helps. Heptobiliary CT scanning, technician labeled immuno and diastic acid, liver biopsy sometimes, and intraoperative cholangiography. These are the diagnostic modalities. And the management is <coughs> enteral feeding because if it is TPN, early enteral feeding will reduce the chances of <coughs> use of necessity of TPN. So, and discontinuous of internal the lipid component is the most common, the problematic for the joint development. So, you can reduce it, you can give uh, fish oil or parental uh, fish emulsions decrease in the internal lipid. And surgery is a, especially biliary atresia, the treatment of surgery, Kasai procedure is nothing but intro is called as a hepatoportoentrastomy. So, what is called as interstens is directly connected to the liver. So this type of Kasai procedure is developed. So that much is this. Thank you very much. These are about the neonatal jaundice. Okay. Thank you, Valaki. Spare in time.